Hi. This is Dr. Kirk Shepard, 2017 President of the Medical Affairs Professional Society, or MAPS, welcoming you to the ongoing series of medical affairs webinars sponsored by MAPS. The title of today's webinar is Medical Affairs in Drug and Medical Device Companies. Does One Size Fit All? Presented by Ann Ford and Robin Shapiro. This presentation is a response to questions we've received from medical affairs colleagues about the similarities and differences between medical affairs organizations supporting device and pharma companies. Today, you will hear both sides of the discussion, the similarities and the differences. Medical Affairs Professional Society has been formed to lead the life sciences industry in a transformation of the medical affairs function to support the evolving healthcare landscape. By establishing a network of medical affairs professionals, not as a single event, but as a continuous forum working together to be a prominent voice of medical affairs. An organization where we can realize and create the potential and vision of medical affairs, promoting excellence in medical affairs. We therefore invite you to visit the website at medicalaffairs.org and become a founding member of MAPS with the rest of us as we all work together to strengthen the voice of medical affairs. And I hope to see many of you at the first MAPS annual conference in June in Baltimore. Please again go to medicalaffairs.org website and then click on the annual meeting tab. Now to introduce today's presenters. Ann Ford currently serves as Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer at Medline Industries Incorporated in Northfield, Illinois. After completing her nursing education at Marquette University in Milwaukee, she received her JD degree from DePaul University College of Law in Chicago, Illinois. Until she became a lawyer, Ann worked as a high-risk obstetrics nurse, pediatric intensive care, and neonatal intensive care. Upon graduating from law school, she spent 11 years in private practice representing physicians, nurses, and hospitals. After private practice, Ann transitioned to in-house legal and compliance roles. Anne has been intimately involved with the development of the medical affairs function at Medline. She's a frequent speaker on the healthcare legal and compliance topics at national conferences. The second speaker, Robin Shapiro, is founder and attorney at Health Sciences Law Group, LLC, and a significant experience in representing clients with respect to research compliance issues, healthcare compliance issues, bioethics issues, and corporate and commercial issues faced by pharmaceutical and medical device manufacturers. Robin's past position as professor of bioethics at the Medical College of Wisconsin and her 26-year leadership as director of the Center for the Study of Bioethics at the Medical College of Wisconsin complement her wide-ranging experience in health law. Robin Shapiro has received numerous awards, including the 2011 when she was named Milwaukee's Healthcare Law Lawyer of the Year. Robin also is a frequent presenter at national conferences and has been author to more than 50 publications on these topics. And now today's presenters, Ann Ford and Robin Shapiro. Ann, please start. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, as Kirk said, Robin and I will be discussing during the presentation today the similarities and the differences between medical affairs functions from organization to organization, company to company, whether it be a large established pharmaceutical company, a small startup medical device company, or anything in between. Uh, as you will hear during our uh, presentation today, we believe there are probably more commonalities than differences, uh, and we in, in encourage you to uh, add your experience and questions throughout the presentation, which we will address at the end. Robin? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, and I'm delighted, as always, to have at my side both Anne and Kirk. So what we want to do is to go over, as Anne described, whether one size fits all or whether it doesn't and there are differences. And despite the technology of the webinar setup, we're hoping to discuss this with you. So please, as we go along, feel free to submit via the chat function 
um, comments or questions that you may have so that we can take them and respond to them either as we're going along or uh, at the end when we'll actually be posing some questions to the audience. But let's go to the next slide and see about how one size, that is one size for a medical affairs organization, does fit all. Um, the next size we point out some, the next slide, sorry, we start to point out some of the commonalities. So first of all, there is a common evolution of medical affairs and its importance. Responsibilities that once were lodged with commercial teams have shifted clearly to medical affairs. Um, and this hasn't been required by law, but it certainly has been pushed by a number of factors. First of all, we've seen throughout the years and increasingly in most recent years, increasing pressure from regulators to separate the medical and the commercial functions of an organization. Where do we see that? Well, going all the way back to 2003 in one of the documents that's, that's cited most often for this notion, the OIG's Compliance Guidance offer, Office of the Inspector General, um, it clearly says in that document that there needs to be uh, a separation of sales and medical affairs activities, that this is critical with respect to research and consulting and grant funding. Very clear guidance, very clear statement. We also see this pressure to have, ha have the evolution that we've seen unfold unfold in corporate integrity agreements. So corporate integrity, integrity agreements, as you know, are settlements of lawsuits or actions brought by the government against companies um, and a way to resolve them. These agreements uh, on a number of occasions recommend that medical affairs departments be instituted or that medical affairs departments that are existing take on the performance of certain specified functions. A couple of uh, examples, uh, in 2008, Cephalon CIA, uh, this, this allegation was related to off-label drug promotion, and one of the terms of the corporate integrity agreement required the medical affairs manager to certify the department's compliance with certain federal health care program requirements, with certain FDA requirements, and with other obligations set out in the CIA. More recently, in 2010, Allergan, that CIA, um, this addressed also uh, off-label marketing of Botox. Um, the CIA required the sales reps to refer off-label information requests that were received by the company to the Medical Affairs Department and it required that the information that then would be provided uh, align with the FDA statutes and regulations on the issue. So these CIAs really are a way to glean the OIG's concept of best practices in terms of having a medical affairs department and what it should do. Um, another incentive for the shift of responsibilities that once were lodged with commercial teams to medical affairs comes in FDA guidance. And in fact, some of it goes all the way back to 1997, uh, where the FDA came out with guidance that distinguishes between marketing, which it regulates, and scientific exchange uh, with healthcare providers, which it does not. So we're already way back then starting to see this line being drawn with a strong suggestion that organizations uh, such as medical device and drug companies adhere to this difference in terms of responsibilities. We also see that public scrutiny about transparency, about who does what, about who should do what, has been enhanced in recent years. and so the evolution of the Medical Affairs Department 
also is responding to that. So basically, the medical affairs organization in a company has evolved into a separate organization that often sits within development um, organization, but works primarily on post-approval activities and has the scientific and clinical expertise to support the company's commercial products. So that's one way in which one size really does fit all or a similarity. If we move to the next slide, we see a couple of more examples about how one slide um, fits all. So in slide seven, um, often the personnel who occupy a medical affairs department have similar backgrounds because of what they're supposed to do. So they need to be able to understand and effectively communicate the science behind the product. And so not surprisingly, they often have advanced degrees, MDs, PharmDs, master's degrees, so on and so forth. And often the medical affairs organization or, or department will have, will take on certain common core functions. And briefly, those include regulatory support, um, medical education, and often this um, gets more thought, more scrutiny. Um, we go back to the notion that companies have an ethical obligation to ensure that their products are used effectively and safely. And so company supported, supported medical education can help with that, can help address that imperative and address the needs of healthcare providers and understanding the product, all with a goal of benefiting patients. So another core function is medical research health economics and outcome studies, and particularly lately, ongoing safety monitoring, of, often uh, also a common function of medical affairs, and medical communications, and this happens on a number of fronts. Medical affairs, as you know, fields medical questions, um, not listed here, but uh, it assists with strategy to align the timing of clinical trial data locks with the release of key data points at certain high-level scientific meetings. Um, they help with the design and execution of a publication plan relating to a product. So the timing of abstract submissions, um, defining or helping to define when key manuscripts um, ideally will be published in the years leading up to and following a product launch. They can help with development of clear and consistent language to describe clinical results um, in a way that can kind of maximize information giving and the buzz around a new product. They, in medical affairs, assist with medical writing. Um, they assist with promotional review activities, so they help um, in critical ways, legal and regulatory and compliance, verify the accuracy of clinical messages that are developed by a product team. In the next slide, we'll see that medical affairs departments also face common challenges from company to company. Um, and those include the following. Um, communicating the value of the function, of the medical affairs function, to key internal stakeholders and providing the right performance incentives to those in the department can be challenging. Why? Well, we really, because of the need for the separation which drives the creation of medical affairs in the first place, we can't measure success in a way that's directly linked to sales and revenue. Um, and the metrics that we do see used often, so number of calls that a medical information center receives or number of relationships with KOLs, these often don't tell us much about the impact of a specific medical affairs program. So communicating internally the value of the function can be a challenge. Another challenge uh, relates, and this is particularly true in recent years, um, relates to the demands for evidence-based value. And we're seeing that customers and payers and accreditation bodies and government and employers, these all are demanding 
evidence-based value. Um, so there's a shift from price to value. In the old days, the competition was mostly on the basis of price, but that's not true anymore, as you know. We're seeing all of these groups, regulators, policymakers, patients, um, demanding more complete picture on the value of the products that are produced. We're also seeing, and this has gone on now for some years, greater restrictions on reaching physicians in healthcare provider organizations. There is not the same open door policy for people other than medical affairs personnel to have access in order to explain product. And then globalization also is uh, posing challenges to more and more companies. And medical affairs is finding itself in need of developing capabilities to support the company's operations in all sorts of countries where uh, the company is operating. So there has to be a coordination of the medical affairs function between all of the countries in which a company uh, does business. The next slide um, talks about <clears throat> common needs um, of medical affairs departments wherever they are, and here are just a couple. There's a need, of course, for robust policies and procedures and comprehensive training. And then, um, and add, uh, kind of completing my piece for now on a high note, um, there is commonality in that universally uh, speaking, there is a value add supplied by medical affairs, in my mind anyway. Uh, medical affairs certainly can and does position itself as a source of scientific support to do these critical things, to catalyze product potential, to bridge R&D on the one hand and commercial on the other, to generate and communicate evidence-based value, going back to that notion, to all sorts of stakeholders. So it is, in a nutshell, uniquely positioned as the medical face of the company in a way that's really very different than the sales organization. It often has strong ties with both community and academic uh, MDs, and it can be an effective conduit for the flow of information out to the medical community and then back into the company itself. Um, it can also help external parties understand and navigate internal waters, and we all know that there are those. So this shift away from being a supporting function to now a central and strategic customer-facing one is a very important role with all sorts of possibilities that I think medical affairs departments in any company share. Um, and at this point, Anne, I'm going to turn it back to you to talk about how one size does not fit all. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I'm going to start off by giving you my perspective. Uh, as Robin said, I'm going to be talking about some of the uniqueness from company to company and from types of companies to types of companies. Uh, and giving you, interspersed with that, some of my own experiences as Kirk mentioned at the top, uh, I have been intimately involved in the implementation of a formal medical affairs function at uh, Medline. We had informal medical affairs activities performed across various departments, uh, but instituting a formal program uh, has been very educational for, for me in learning some of these differences. You can go to the next slide. One of the differences is organizational models. To whom should the medical affairs department report? Uh, does it report to the C-suite? Does it report to the R&D department? Does it report to a commercial division that may function like an independent company within a larger company? These are questions that certainly uh, were addressed and needed to be addressed by Medline as we set up the, um, the organization without having had a medical affairs formal function in the past. Uh, there is a tremendous need to address the cultural changes that a formal program uh, will, will entail. Some of the other organizational model 
uh, issues are global companies. If you have a global company, you have medical affairs, you have clinical research and, and activities across the globe, you need to ensure that you have alignment uh, so that you avoid redundancy. In individual markets, it can be organized by a brand, by a unit, by a therapeutic area, tailored, that is, to meet the unique needs of the product or the specific area. Go to the next slide. There's also differences from not only within companies based on their size or their geographical reach, but there's differences between medical device companies and pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies have traditionally had uh, the medical affairs departments. Medical device companies are more new to this. Uh, I was impressed by the Olympus case from 2016. Uh, Olympus paid more than $650 million to settle some fraud and abuse allegations, and part of it was the way they handled grants. They had their sales uh, personnel involved in making grant decisions. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with that case. So, Olympus is a medical device company and not a pharmaceutical company. I think that was a strong message to the medical device community that this is something that the enforcers are going to be requiring. Some of the just differences uniquely between the kinds of companies and, and how medical affairs functions might need to address these differently, the devices evolve and change over time while drugs don't as much. In terms of FDA regulations regarding promotional activity, there are different guidelines or different regulations for medical device companies and for pharmaceutical companies. Often the medical device companies are, are smaller than a pharmaceutical company. Because they're smaller, there may be smaller revenues, smaller resources, uh, and a need to have perhaps people in medical affairs wear more than one hat. There's often more off-label use with devices than drugs because of the nature of a medical device versus a drug that is often formulated for a specific uh, treatment that is promoted. There's more emphasis on comparative effectiveness with devices compared to drugs. Finally, the functional role within the company can vary. A smaller company may lack, again, the budgetary and human resources to create a large medical affairs organization. In our company, uh, we went through various different iterations to determine not only where the medical affairs would report, it's going to be reporting through the, the R&D uh, entity in our company, uh, but we also wanted to determine how much is this going to cost the company. So we've been able to leverage different uh, resources that we already had and some that we didn't to create a, uh, a right-sized medical affairs function for our company. The culture and history of your company can also impact the functional role. Uh, again, the way companies are organized, I think, are, are different from company to company as I was starting the, the quest to implement a medical affairs function at Medline, I tried to seek the specific guidebook or the, the recipe for how to set up a medical affairs function. And what I consistently heard is there is no one size. There is no one way to do it. What's important is knowing what questions to ask and so that you can tailor it to your specific company's needs. Robin and I have put together some questions that we will put out there. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on these questions. And in the meantime, we will discuss kind of our points of view on them. So if you go to the first question, thank you. What are the best practices for communicating value of a medical affairs organization to internal stakeholders? Robin, do you want to start commenting on that? Sure. Um, and, of course, the answer is going to be slightly 
uh, or maybe a great deal different depending on the company. <coughs> Excuse me, depending on um, some of the factors that Anne was talking about just a minute ago, the culture of the company, the history of the company, the size of the company, the um, length of time during which the medical affairs um, department or organization has been in existence. I think that for uh, any and all of the above, um, it is good to mention um, in a sales pitch, that is an internal sales pitch, um, the value from a compliance point of view, given the factors that we talked about at the outset and the regulators um, and the public's demand for the separation, but also to focus on what uh, is changing and how medical affairs really is uniquely positioned to respond to new demands, new demands for evidence uh, of value. So uh, it is with the skills and the expertise and um, the reputation of the medical affairs department that evidence can be produced in order to gain a competitive advantage with product in today's world. Um, it is with the um, stature and the reputation and the networking of the medical affairs personnel that one can reach uh, those in positions of potential uh, customers who are interested in the science and in talking to a peer. So I think that highlighting those facts uh, are some approaches uh, that may fit into best practices for communicating value. And do you have uh, additional comments? I would just add that this has certainly been the case at, in our company. Again, adding my perspective as a compliance officer who has been instrumental in implementing medical affairs in our company, partially for compliance reasons and for all the other reasons we've mentioned, uh, we have noticed an increased demand from our sales side to have MSLs, to have people who are able to go out into the field and speak strictly to the science. Uh, they also are craving to have a specific education. Robin mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, that as the AdvoMed code cites and other in the pharma code, we have an obligation to train our uh, users of our products on the safety and efficacy of our products. So it has been a right time for us to, to communicate this value. I'm going to jump to the next question. Again, please, anyone uh, in the audience, can chime in through the chat room function if you'd like to ask us a question or comment on any of these. The next question we've posed out there is, what are the best practices for dealing with increased compliance issues that surround the increased use of MSLs? And I'm going to start on this one and then toss it to Robin. The way I look at it, again, I'm a compliance professional, is the more touch points we have with healthcare providers, the greater our risk. Obviously, MSLs are a key part as our sales agents to the success of a company. But we need to evaluate and, and put in place processes to improve the likelihood of, of these compliance issues coming to, uh, coming to bear. Robin? Um, I would... Um... Uh, agree with everything that you said, and I thought that maybe we could just go to, um, for the moment, uh, we can return to this, but we do have a couple of questions that have been submitted that I thought we could address before the requester loses hope that we'll see that she has submitted some. Um, so she has asked uh, whether we could talk more about the different regs, and I'm assuming that that is based off of comments you had, Anne, about different regs relating to promotion for um, devices and drugs. And she also asks about who determines whether something, whether a product is a device or a drug, is it the FDA? So the answer to the last question is yes. At the end of the day, it is the FDA because the FDA is going to um, 
approve or not approve and subject the product to various regulations depending on its determination about whether it is a drug or a device or both. And sometimes, uh, as I'm sure the requester knows, a product can be a combination. Um, so that isn't much help, but I think it's the truth. Um, in terms of the different regulations, particularly regarding promotional activity of uh, device and drugs, um, it, it gets really complicated, but at a high level, um, basically the FDA has complete jurisdiction over drug prescription labeling and advertising. Uh, it also has complete jurisdiction over medical device labeling. But the FDA's jurisdiction is more limited uh, when we get to device advertising. So the FDA does regulate advertising of what they call or classify as restricted medical devices. And those are the more complex and invasive, often, uh, medical devices. But if we're talking about a non-restricted device, um, advertising of that device is regulated by the FTC. So because of that, the FDA has come out with much less guidance about medical device promotion because it, in fact, just doesn't have jurisdiction over some of that vis-a-vis -vis some devices. And the FTC, though, um, its guidance, it does allow um, more leeway for the most part. So by way of example, for a non-restricted uh, medical device ad, which again is under the purview of the FTC. Um, the FTC does not require fair balance, which would be required if the FDA were, were weighing in. Rather, it requires a reasonable standard of truthfulness. So it's a little bit different standard, um, and so all of this makes it complicated. Um, in terms of what medical affairs department personnel need to know and what advice they're going to give. So, sorry, I might have gotten more in the weeds than the requester um, uh, had in mind. Um, and I think there are a couple of other questions. Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out and then uh, okay. we can respond. Sure. What is the role of the MAMSL? in the pre-launch or startup environment for device companies? The, the question is whether or not there's less desire to talk about devices pre-launch. And Robin, I don't know if you have some um, experience and comments on that. Well, you know, again, I think that pre-launch, the medical affairs department could have all sorts of rules, and it's not just talking in the field. Um, which you have to be careful about anyway because you can't promote an investigational device. But I do think that having a strategy for um, pre-launch for, A, let's get from our um, customers or the KOLs or, or both, what's needed? What are they needing in clinical practice? So how should our development work? So this is way pre-launch. How should our development work be structured? Where do we want to go with this? And then when there is a product idea, um, I think medical affairs can be very helpful in terms of building the strategy for, um, for an eventual launch. So what kind of evidence do we really need in order to make various claims about whether it can do X, Y, or Z or is safe in A, B, or C ways. Medical, device, uh, medical affairs can be very helpful in all of that strategizing, all of which, of course, is uh, pre-launch. Thanks, Robin. That was what I, um, my, it reflects my ideas as well. I would like to just say it probably is true comparing pharma to medical device that the pre-launch discussions are not going to be um, as detailed or as uh, early on as pharma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to go to the next question. Uh, does one organizational model, this is from the audience, does one organizational model for reporting work better than the other? For example, up to the CEO directly or through R&D, through commercial sales and marketing, and why or why not? 
I'll start, Robin. Uh, sure. My, I think that the answer is, uh, unfortunately, like most lawyers <laughs> will give, it depends. So I don't think in this situation there is a one-size-fits-all or there's a best practice. That was something that I, I tried to get out of all the consultants I talked to <laughs> in setting our, our uh, system up at Medline. And they responded with more questions than answers and, and led us to the path to how to determine what questions to ask to determine where, where it is better served. And I think you have to look within your company and see who are in these roles, uh, what are the support, who is best going to be able to support medical affairs? Where do you have the, uh, the most impetus behind supporting medical affairs? In a perfect world, you'd have the top medical affairs individual who's probably a physician reporting to the CEO. Uh, but that doesn't always work in every company. Robin? Yeah, I would agree. I think that of the choices that the requester laid out there, the worst answer would be commercial um, because that does fly in the face or certainly could uh, of the whole notion going back to the first slide, the evolution of the medical affairs department being the desire to create appropriate separation between commercial activities on the one hand and medical affairs activities on the other. So I think that that reporting structure would not be a good idea. Um, but beyond that, I do think uh, yeah, commercial sales and marketing, that would not be a good idea. But the others are possibilities. You know, unfortunately, the and Ann knows this well, the um, question could even be more complicated because sometimes the reporting line is up to compliance. And then you get the sub-question, which is, well, what's compliance reporting line? Does compliance report to legal? And there's a lot of controversy about whether that's the wrong idea too. So um, organizational structures and models can be a challenge. Um, I do think that it depends on the strengths and culture and capabilities of the individual organization, but reporting up to commercial sales and marketing is not a good idea. And Robin, the same questioner asked, what about in a matrixed organization or structure where you have a combined commercial and uh, R&D reporting structure? Yeah, so uh, you're, I'd love to hear your thoughts too, Anne, but for me this is confusing um, or threatens to be confusing. So I think that that matrix reporting line structure would be problematic. Uh, Robin, I agree with you, and based on uh, kind of the the processes we've been going through over the last year or so in in setting up the function here, uh, I think it becomes less confusing by separating them. If you have an, an, a new organization that has, or excuse me, a new medical affairs organization within your company, to start off with it matrixed is is not a good idea. Um, and for all the reasons Robin cited, involving commercial is 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 unwise. But I do want to take the question, and we can go back to the one in between, Anne, but one just came in, and it's a good question, and it's a follow-up. Um, how much collaboration should there be between your heads of medical affairs and commercial heads, since you stated that reporting to commercial is not a good idea? Um, good point. And I think that appropriate communication and collaboration is very important. So. In order, the, the medical affairs head or personnel, um, in discharging one of the responsibilities that we talked about a little bit before, which is assisting with uh, product strategy and then product launch, there's a lot to be learned from commercial uh, about what what uh, should be thought about initially. So, and that's just one example. Um, the commercial folks might well hear about um, some safety signals or complaints that should then be turfed over to, again, communicated to medical affairs so that further inquiry and investigation can happen. So I'm not at all, we're not at all, meaning to say that these have to be complete silos and never work together. It's just that the appropriate separation is very important. I don't know, Anne, if you want to 
elaborate on that? Well, I think I'd like to ask for the slide to be advanced because the next question that you and I have put out there is, what is meaningful separation oh, of good. medical Great. affairs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the meaningful separation from, of medical affairs from mm -hmm. commercial departments in a small company? Mm -hmm. What are examples of specific lines that should be drawn? How can funding of medical affairs department be structured to promote meaningful separation? So I think that is kind of the, the word there is meaningful. Yeah. And go ahead, Robin. Oh, well, I, I say I'm glad that you noticed that that's exactly where we were going. And so, you know, drawing some lines in the in the sand, so to speak, uh, in order to be illustrative. He, here's an example about meaningful separation. It seems to me that sales personnel should not be able to use um, a grant, a research grant program, to incentivize purchases of the product. So creating appropriate separation between the research grant program and its goings on and the sales personnel's involvement in it, that's an appropriate and meaningful separation in my mind. In terms of um, funding uh, aligning with meaningful separation, it seems to me that medical affairs should not have to be reliant on sales um, for its funding on a periodic basis. So there should be, ideally, um, separate line items in budgets for medical affairs, and that, in my mind, should not be dependent on achieving any specific sales or marketing targets. Those budget uh, line items should not hinge on uh, satisfaction of that. Um, that you know, a company is in all ways um, dependent to some extent on its performance and its growth. So there certainly, you know, at that level, could be flexibility in terms of budgeting um, for medical affairs. But funding decisions should not be specifically sales driven, um, and it also should be adequate to assure that medical affairs can. Um, you know, staff all that it needs to do to, in part, assure compliance. Again, from my personal experience, this is probably the most sensitive topic in implementing a medical affairs function. And I'm sure that we are not different from a lot of other medical device companies or other smaller startups that haven't had this before. Uh, the commercial area is certainly interested and, and very um, intimately tied to the success of their product, which is intimately tied to the evidence that supports it. So it's a great question, and I think we, as Robin said earlier, uh, it's not a complete and utter silo, but it's a meaningful separation. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Anne, I think we also got another question that is, um, are there any restrictions, I think this was meant to be restrictions, for a drug company following AdvaMed guidelines instead of the pharma code? Um, so it's important to note at the outset that these are um, guidelines and not law um, in any way you know, they tend to be used as evidence of gold standard or best practices or standard of care or what have you. But there's nothing that says you that you cannot glean important insight or guidance from any code of ethics uh, that's, that's out there and relates to life sciences. That's, that's my take on that. Anne? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I don't know if the requester had further, if we're if we're targeting the right question yeah, I don't uh, asked, but I would say the same. In fact, on the medical device side, we we often refer to the pharma code of ethics. We don't look at them as as uh, Robin said, as this is only for you and this is only for this kind of company. They're all guidances that help us to determine what's the right thing to do in a specific circumstance. And it's important to note two other things, I think. One, um, 
these are not the only organizations that have come out with codes that address these issues, and I'm talking globally. So there are other codes in, that in this country and in other countries that touch on some of some of these issues. So not, none are written in stone. Um, and the other thing, you know, to, to your point, Anne, if we look at that infamous or famous 2003 um, guidance um, that we talked about in the beginning that came out of the OIG, the compliance guidance, it really was targeted and the title refers to um, guidance relating to pharmaceutical companies, but there's an important footnote that says, oh, by the way, everything that we say also would apply to medical device companies. So I don't think we should get hung up uh, about whether the title is specifically calling out as audience either drug or device. Uh, we might have time to uh, go to the last couple of questions, if you could go to the last slide. Could advance it to the last slide, please. The next one. What steps can be taken to assure that MSLs do not become an extension of a sales organization. Um, Robin, did you have anything you wanted to say before we kind of break this down a little further? Um, you know, part of, part of the answer, I think, goes to what are the needs of a medical affairs organization and the robust policies and guidances and uh, training. So hopefully all of that would help to set parameters for MSLs staying in their appropriate swim lane, so to speak. Um, but beyond that, and still at a high level, um, uh, review or audits or um, evaluations of how the medical affairs organization, as well as any other organization in your company, work would, I'm assuming, be an important component of what compliance does in, in your company. So, Anne, this is kind of in your sweet spot. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, too. Yeah. Uh, the other two questions there were, does it depend on company size and it just does it depend on company culture? So taking all of those together, I think mm -hmm. this is what I would see as, as part of our role as the compliance organization supporting medical affairs is that we need to be able to help audit and set in place the right processes to guide the organization because, again, it can be confusing to those out in the field. Uh, and I've talked to a number of people who've been in these roles that there is often pressure to, uh, to mix, mix it up. So I think the steps that can be taken, you know, involve a lot of the different controls you would put in place for interactions with healthcare providers. Um, you could do ride-alongs, you can um, do audits, you can uh, periodically check in on how the structure is, is functioning, you can ensure that the MSLs have a, uh, a reporting line to someone who has the authority to act if the, uh, if the MSL is being requested to do something outside of that uh, organizational role. Mm -hmm. All makes sense. Do we have time for one more question? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, should the last question on our slide here is should policy on dissemination of off label literature differ depending on product? So just my own couple of thoughts, Anne. Um, there are some companies, I think companies would answer this differently, depending um, in part on their risk appetite. Um, there are some who feel like um, the if they have a, a product that is very um, low risk, 
um, that the there's more leeway in terms of not only responding to unsolicited requests for off-label, but also providing off-label literature in certain circumstances as long as it's accurate and so forth might be okay. So I think that in practice there are differences. Um, uh, I'm not I'm not sure what all drives those differences, um, but I think we'd get different responses if we were to open this up to individuals in the audience representing different companies. And I, I think if you want to weigh in, that'd be great. That would be great. Um, and I would say just from my uh, uh, perspective, again, from a device company that's implementing a formal medical affairs function, uh, the way I, I look at this question is we have over 350,000 product SKUs. Uh, there are varying different uh, degrees of medical device, classes of medical devices, but we would certainly look at this question pretty carefully to say should the dissemination of off-label literature di differ depending on product. Um, so I, I guess it would be another, another uh, area that I would put in the one size does not fit all category. Yes. Good good point. Good point. Are there any other questions before we turn it back to Kirk to wrap up the the webinar? Anna and Robin Heights Kirk. Um, excellent. Um, discussion and presentation. I just have one question maybe some people might be interested in as far as the strategy of going forth to create the need, the urge for a medical affairs department because you guys have really faced the gamut as far as you know people seeing the value or not. In other words, as we look at two buckets, is it better perhaps a strategy to go forth with the risk having them see what's happened to other companies that have not uh, done what's appropriate for medical affairs? Or is it better to try and express the, the value of the product enhancing activities of medical affairs or both? Maybe you could describe that a little bit because maybe some people are wrestling with that who are at device companies or smaller companies and trying just to get people to see the need for medical affairs. I'm going to, I'll start Robin just because this is what I've been living and breathing and yeah. um, as Robin and Kirk know, we've, I've kind of gone back and forth on the answer to that question. Um, as you might suspect, maybe a compliance viewpoint might focus more on risk than benefit and mitigating risk, but knowing the culture of our company, uh, really I wanted to focus on what are the, the wins, what are the gains we can get here. Uh, so Kirk, at the end of the day, I really emphasize them equally instead of putting risk over benefit. I think it's hard for the commercial areas to see why do I need this benefit? Um, I, things are going fine the way they are. So you, ha you can't solely focus on that without bringing in the risk element. And in my own experience with various companies is exactly that, that really both are very important. I do think that if we're talking about educating um, a board, for example, from a pure compliance point of view, um, it's important that those people, and we know this more in recent years because of what's come out of the government and um, guidance and so forth about obligations of boards of directors of companies, it's important that they know these risks um, and that therefore they embrace the efforts undertaken by their medical affairs organization to mitigate that via appropriate separation and so forth. But you know, for the people on the ground, so to speak, I think it's really important to not just scare them to death, but to point out how we all will have value add um, in terms of productivity um, and efficiency of the company with a medical affairs function. Great, thank you. Well, uh, as well as speaking for myself, I know I speak for many people on the line, really are appreciating giving your insights, but particularly your perspective um, as far as coming from the mostly device area, but also small company startups and both of you being in legal slash compliance. So to me, it was very informative. 
at the same time, very relaxed. I, I really feel as if you should both have your own radio show, you know, the Anne and Robin because <laughs> it really it, okay. it occurred very naturally the way you handled the questions and the discussion <laughs> back and forth. So maybe we could talk about that sometime. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> thank you from MAPS as far as your presentation. And until next time, I say goodbye to MAPS and thank you for your attention on the line.